Um, my name is Catherine Walsh. I'm an embryologist, uh, but I am unique in that I started a PGT lab several years ago. Um, so have perspective in both, but right now we're going to switch gears and talk about the embryologist's perspective. And I just wanted to get a show of hands in the room, um, maybe who are in here are uh, clinicians, MDs and nurses, and then embryologists, all right, and administrators or anyone else, okay. Um, so we are going to switch gears and go into the lab here. I think it's something um, that in at least the general sessions we don't talk about the PGT aspect in as often. So when we were um, discussing with Thermo I thought this was a really um, interesting perspective to add the genetics lab along with the, the embryology side of things. So in our lab, this is what we test for, PGTA, PGTSR, and PGTM, and I think it's, you know, well defined that um, these are available. Now we're moving into PGTP um, and polygenics, but that's something completely different. And so I just wanted to talk about these different tests and how they affect the embryology lab um, throughout the cycle, throughout following up for, or even pre-cycle when you're trying to order a test and everything that goes into that, and then after how you collect the data and follow up with the patients. So in the lab, um, we have many different kinds of challenges, and these are the ones that I'm going to go through today. So from workflow and how you incorporate um, biopsy into your every day to how you deal with no results and not having um, a result for an embryo biopsy, and p perhaps if that means rebiopsy and how that works into that workflow, and then finally touch on a mosaicism a little bit and what that means um, there for your embryologists. So obviously, as Dr. Nakuda shared, we've seen a very large increase in PGT cases, and so the first thing that that means is the need for additional staffing. staffing. So um, not only is your in workload increased through biopsy, but also when looking at vitrification, when a lot of our cases have moved to freeze-all cycles, um, like I had mentioned before, the data entry and the outcomes and who follows that, who follows those patients, um, and then finally, rebiopsy. So <clears throat> back in 2014, um, Dr. Alakani and Dr. Go. Um, Dr. McCaffrey and Dr. McCullough did a great study on looking at the number of hours um, it takes for pers personnel hours in a, in a standard IVF case. And so way back when, when we didn't have all these various procedures that we were doing, you know, it looked like it was around nine personnel hours per case. Up in 2014, come 2014, and with the advent of many new procedures, we were looking at, in their study, closer to 20 personnel hours. And I would say probably in the last eight years, um, again, with an increase in PGT, inc increase in um, vitrification, increase in FETs, you know, I think that that now, it's well beyond that 20 hours um, per case, and I think that's really affecting us, at least on the embryology side, with staffing and the need for, um, really to take a really careful look at what's happening in our laboratories and um, how we can make sure that those laboratories aren't understaffed for various reasons, including burnout, um, liability, um, and just to make sure that your patients are getting the best care in there. The increase in PGT has also um, you know, added a need for additional equipment. So labs where we could perhaps get by with one ICSI station before are needing more micromanipulators, um, another inverted microscope, another laser perhaps to help with the, with the biopsies. Um, we're needing more IVF workstation st space, more stereoscopes in order to perform the thaws and to do the embryo load or the uh, sample loading, um, and then of course cryo storage. So if we aren't discarding um, any embryos, whether they be aneuploid or mosaic or whatnot, um, how are we managing all of the cryopreserved material and what does that mean for our lab sizes um, and the capital equipment that we need to invest in or even just the space because I think, you know, a lot of labs that I work with, they build out this great big brand new lab um, and before you know it, before they're even just barely moved in, they need more equipment, more space and, and the like. So it's really interesting to think about how PGT has an effect on all of those um, elements. Moving a little, little bit into no results, so um, sequence 46, our data shows that 
our overall percentage of failed QC samples, so anything that does not give a result, um, we hover right around 2%. Um, and so we don't split up our no results into cha a chaotic profile, so that might mean that there's DNA or something else in the tube and the result could not be read or res resulted, um, and no DNA where um, a PCR test or a, a gel was run and there wasn't any DNA detected in the tube. We don't, we don't separate any of that out, we combine it all and our failed QC rate is what we call it and it's um, right around 2%. So if we see any labs that are above 2%, we're going out and talking to them and trying to shoot, troubleshoot why that might be. And so um, as an embryologist, putting my embryologist hat on, you know, I think that there's a lot of vari variability between embryologists um, and of course IVF labs. Um, not only in the things that I've listed here, like experience, size of the biopsy, the day of the biopsy, <clears throat> but also other things that maybe might be a little bit more obscure, um, like culture systems or patient population. Um, of course, there's also a variability between reference laboratories. You know, different labs are using different buffers. Of course, we're all, many of us are using different platforms and that has a large effect on um, the results that come out. And finally, um, just to touch really quickly on shipping, you know, I think that there are these outer elements of the whole process that we don't really think about or look into that often. And I think that there definitely is a need to try to pay attention to those things a little bit more so we can have a little bit more consistency um, with what we're sending to our labs. So going back to no results for a moment, um, this is what we look at when we see our samples come in the door at the PGT laboratory. Um, we take a look at all of the PCR tubes with the little drop of media. You know, we're looking at maybe a one to three microliter drop of fluid there at the bottom of the tube. But you can see the samples on the right um, that's quite some variability and the, the variability between one and four microliter, microliters to the human eye may seem really, really small, um, or, but you know, under a microscope or under a, a zoomed in photo like this, you can see that there's a clear difference and the difference there will mean a result versus a no result. So I think that these are important key points that we you know, maintain the communication between reference laboratory and embryology laboratory to make sure everyone's understanding how big an of an impact something might, like this might have on the results that you get. So moving from no results to rebiopsy, um, and the need for rebiopsy if we get no results at embryos is all about timing. Well, how are we gonna incorporate this into our workflow? Rebiopsy takes, of course, even longer than a standard biopsy because then you're warming that embryo, biopsying that embryo, sending it out again, so a whole nother shipping process. Um, and then getting those results and where are we in the timing of that patient's FET if they need those results for a transfer and whatnot. I think that's really important to take a look at when um, trying to figure out how best to give the best outcomes, um, work with the patients to get the best outcomes. In rebiopsy, obviously quality of the embryo is important. This is actually um, a picture of an embryo that was thought out for rebiopsy from my team just yesterday. You know, and the question is, okay, well, how long do we wait? The courier is coming to pick up the samples. Do we let this go even another day and rebiopsy it? Do we rebiopsy it at all? Do we just say, hey, this one really didn't make it. It perhaps shouldn't have even been biopsied the first time. Um, and how we communicate to that to the clinical team and then how we communicate to that to the patients to make sure that everybody involved is um, you know, understanding the decision making process um, for white rebiopsy. So mosaicism or um, you know, the this this is a profile of a of a mosaic embryo. You know, I think that there's it's been hotly debated and um, I'm glad that most of the the clinics that we work with now do are open to transferring mosaics. I think um, you know Dr. Nikita shared that there's plenty of data out there that um, they obviously can lead to healthy pregnancies and um, are successful. And so I think it's something that everyone should be open to um, these days and working with these embryos that do have some intermediate copy number. And so what are we we really talking about? Again, we're talking about a mix of cells within the sample. And I think one of the important things to remember, which I think um, um, we you know, often lose in our conversations with our patients or with our clinicians is that you know, the, that embryo is normal. Well, no, the embryo is not necessarily normal. All you have is a piece of that embryo. And so it can only be as um, 
it, you're really only talking about the cells that were sent to the lab. Do we know if that's um, representative of the, of the entire embryo? No, of course not. You know, do, again, Dr. Paulson often talks about his soccer ball um, analogy, but um, we can only do the best with the results as we can with whatever came into the laboratory. So um, obviously taking that sample is extremely important. So looking at causes and considerations, I think again, noting the variability from IVF lab um, to IVF lab, at sequence 46, we obviously work with many different laboratories and we do look, see a clear difference in mosaicism between um, IVF labs. Again, there are many things that can, that can be attributed to. Um, biopsy technique, the day of biopsy, various platform thresholds. And so just to understand that in order to be able to talk with, again, the clinicians and also the patients in explaining um, the limitations of our technology in order to you know, best serve them. So here's another video I got yesterday um, from one of my mentors, Debbie Venier, who's in the audience here. How do I, let's see. So talking about lab to lab variability and looking at new methods that have come about let's see. Um, and seeing whether or not you know, that increases or decreases mosaicism or perhaps doesn't have any effect on it at all. This is a new method that we've as embryologists have been using maybe for the last two, three, four years. Um, it's the, we call it, we fondly call it the flick method, um, where we tap the mic manipulator and you could see that that piece just flew right off instead of having there, there be a lot of manipulation. Um, instead, it just, you know, the cells break, those junctions are split with the laser. And, and so, you know, in looking at when we change um, techniques, how that affects Things like mosaicism, I think, is really important to look at in our field, um, to look at from a specific laboratory and really analyze, okay, did that benefit us um, or should we go back to the old way because it was better? And I think this has been addressed um, a little bit. Um, so this is a study out of um, Jason Barrett's lab up in, in LA um, looking at repeated high intensity laser biopsy pulses not um, changing any of the genetic testing results or increasing mosaicism. And again, um, another paper from I et al. Um, looking at whether there are risk factors related to chromosomal mosaicism. And some of the things that they touch on here are, okay, they saw increased mosaicism in um, day six by day six uh, blastocysts. Um, they also saw increased mosaicism in poor quality embryos. So really looking at, you know, what we're biopsying and um, the grades of those embryos and whether we can set thresholds based off of that as to what we're biopsying and sending to the laboratory. Finally, again, touching on cryo storage again, you know, um, for many years, many labs that didn't, um, didn't transfer the mosaics, but kept the mosaics stored away for times like these when, when um, we know a little bit more. And the continued need for growth in our, and, and new advances in being able to figure out how we're gonna best store those embryos, um, how we're gonna best counsel our patients on what to keep until they are, have, a, have a complete family. And fan, fan, to finish on NIPGT, um, like Dr. Nakuda did, I think, um, one of the most important things as we continue on and figure out the nest, best next technologies to adopt in our field, um, very, very important to do, obviously, validation. I think that we have to work very closely, especially in something like NIPGT, where every single culture method or um, maybe even media that is used in the laboratory can have effect on something like this. I think it's really challenging for our space to be able to um, unify and streamline and make sure that everybody's working towards those same goals um, when we want to adopt a new technique. And so if we can share results and um, make sure that we're all checking up on each other as far as, you know, I think that the, the embryology, embryologists that I work with, I think are wonderful in sharing and going into their labs and understanding how they really, really do something. Um, oftentimes when I'm trying to troubleshoot, I can't say, oh, well, are you trying this? Are you trying that? I have to physically hop in an airplane and go and see and watch them do it because I think that that's the only time that we're really catching the small nuances that make, might make all the difference in the lab. <laughs>